video was originally recorded May 2018 at Tibet House US in New York City. To watch more videos from this program, please visit TibetHouse.us. This is from uh, a professor at the New School named uh, Jeremy Safran, who uh, did a book some years ago called, uh, that was a dialogue between um, uh, Buddhist teachers and uh, psychotherapists. Uh, he was a back and forth between Buddhist teachers and psychotherapists talking about uh, their approach to uh, trying to uh, save us from ourselves. Um, he, was tra he tragically died the other night, Jeremy Safran, but uh, uh, over the years I always quote the, the epigraph of this book, which I, I'll read to you in a minute is uh, a very personal thing that he's writing about his relationship with his Tibetan Lama that I think is his attempt to talk about uh, what I'm trying to talk about. So this is in a way in, in memory of him now. <laughs> My Tibetan teacher, Karma Tinli Rinpoche, once asked me in his broken, heavily accented English, how does Western psychology treat nervousness? Why do you ask, I responded. Well, he replied, I've always been a nervous person. Even when I was a little boy, I was nervous, and I still am. <coughs> Especially when I have to talk to large groups of people, I don't know, I get nervous. As was often the case with the questions that Karma Tinley asked me, I found myself drawing a complete blank. Part of it was the difficulty of trying to find the words to explain something to somebody whose grasp of English was limited, but there was another more important factor. On the face of it, this was a simple question, but Karma Tinley was a highly respected Lama, now in his 60s, who had spent years mastering the most sophisticated Tibetan Buddhist meditation techniques. Those who knew Karma Tinley considered him to be an enlightened being. In the West, psychotherapists are increasingly turning to Buddhist meditation as a valuable treatment for a variety of problems, including anxiety. Who was I to tell him how to deal with anxiety? And how was it possible that Karma Tinley, with all of his experience meditating, could still be troubled by such everyday concerns? How could an enlightened person be socially anxious? Was he really enlightened? What does it mean to be enlightened? My head swirled with all of these inchoate questions, and for a moment my mind stopped. I felt a sense of warmth coming from Karma Tinley, and I felt warmly towards him. I felt young, soft, open, and uncertain about everything I knew. So I called him up when I, I got the book, which he had asked me to blurb, and I called him up when I read this and told him how much I love this, you know, this is my favorite thing in the book. And he said, oh, his editors wanted him to leave it out because they, they thought it would be too confusing to people. <laughs> but I think that young, soft, open, and uncertain about everything he knew, that's the part that I love that more that even than the socially anxious llama, although, you, you know, I don't think we have to think that our personalities change. We'll be talking about this as we as we go on. If, should any of us ever reach enlightenment, I, I think we'll still be the same person that we always were. Um, but Bob is the expert in, <laughs> in that. <laughs> He'll be telling us. Um, so, okay. From the psychoanalytic point of view, uh, this is from a uh, colleague and friend of mine named Michael Eigen, who's a, a psychoanalyst here in New York, now uh, approaching, uh, he's probably 80 years old or so. And uh, he's an expert in a British psychoanalyst who's been a big influence on me named Wilfred Bion, from whose work I stole the phrase Thoughts Without a Thinker for my first book. Uh, Bion was born in India, came to London, trained as a psychoanalyst, and uh, he had Samuel Beckett as his first patient. Um, and he did, a good, he did a good job with him. <laughs> they influenced each other, I think. So um, this is Eigen writing about Bion, but writing about, um, well, you'll see. 
I think Bion is trying to describe the worst in us, the worst in us. And I think he's trying to do something more. I feel he is saying we must and can survive the worst if we are to be truly compassionate with ourselves and each other, if we're going to be partners with the capacities that constitute us. One of the great experiences in reading Bion, I think, is that over and over we come through the worst. We survive ourselves, build up tolerance for ourselves, make room for ourselves. So I would say this applies to, to the Dharma also. That, that, that's why I'm reading this. That's what we're doing when we're practicing whatever we practice. If we're, if we're not using meditation to avoid ourselves, which is just as possible. Um, Eigen goes on. In the face of the worst that he can experience or envision experiencing, including Beckett, and including total destruction of experience, Bion maintained a faith that openness to the unknowable ultimate reality of a session, of a moment, of a lifetime is somehow linked with growth processes. I think that Bion must have been close to destroying every possibility of goodness in life and that he speaks from his own experience of surviving the great destruction. I think he must have discovered for himself that life erupts in the valley of the shadow of death. I think Bion always had an eye on the backcloth of destruction. He always was facing the horror of himself, a faith that in spite of all horrors, experience is worthwhile, is different from use of faith to avoid experiencing. The faith Bion fought for was linked to intensity of living and risk of openness. So Sharon, Sharon is the expert on faith. And she, we, we had lots of discussions about this, at this way of looking at faith as a, you know, a willingness to be with oneself in, in all of one's uh, most conflicted ways with an eye towards that unknowable, ultimate, mysterious something that the Dharma is o opening up for us and kind of pull, you know, magnetically pulling on us and giving us courage, really, I think, and, and the, the willingness to not waste time, as, as Bob's already <clears throat> talking about. Um, one, of my, one of the big influences on me early on was um, a former Harvard psychology professor who had already been kicked out of Harvard by the time I got to college, named, named Richard Alpert who um, went on to go to India and rename himself Ramdas. And uh, uh, Bob, I believe, <laughs> just came back from Maui where he was spending time yeah. with him. But um, uh, I knew him when I, was, when I first uh, found the Dharma. He was one of the people who introduced it to me. Uh, and then um, I spent a fair amount of time in relatively uh, secret classes that he was giving in Cambridge in those years. And then didn't see him. I went on, went to medical school, got married, moved to New York, had children. Um, didn't see him for a long time. He had a stroke, uh, moved to California. And so about 20 years went by uh, bet between visits. And then uh, maybe 20 years ago, I went to see him after he'd had his stroke and had a short visit with him, an afternoon visit with him when he was still living in California before he was in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he couldn't talk very well because the stroke took out uh, his, he, he had a golden tongue before the stroke, but he had trouble, he could still think, but he had trouble getting the words. But we had a nice uh, sort of elongated conversation that afternoon and he was kind of teasing me <laughs> by, um, you know, oh, are you a Buddhist psychiatrist now? You know, because he still saw me as being 20 years old, I think, even though I was probably 40. Um, uh, he's, are, are you a Buddhist psychiatrist now? And then he said, uh, and I didn't understand him at first, he said, do you see them as already free? Uh, and I, he had to repeat it a couple times before I understood what he was saying. Do you see them, meaning my patients, do you see them as already free? And I thought, oh, yeah, he nailed it, you know, like that's, um, that's what I try to do uh, uh, because that's the great gift of working with people one-on-one -on -one is I can kind of see who they would be if they uh, uh, weren't who they thought they were. 
which, which was Ram Dass's great line, you, you, you know, that you're not who you think you are. Uh, but I can feel that with most people, and so uh, um, without being preachy about it, uh, if I'm good at what I'm doing, I can kind of pull on that, on what I feel there, you know, is there already in them. Uh, this video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special tours with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.us. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in.